So like people were using it. So that was the first time I felt that something was happening, but that was like three years in. So at that time, the money is gone and like the belief in the company like um, was, was gone. And, um... Welcome to the Raw and Real podcast. Are you dreaming of changing your life through opening a business? Or are you curious what obstacles entrepreneurs had to overcome on their journey? Then you're in the right place. My name is Agnes Billig and I'm your host. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Raw and Real podcast. Today I decided to switch things up a little bit and tell you the story of Joe Anderson with outtakes from our interview. So Joe is a product designer and founder of the company Mighty Scout. He comes originally from San Francisco and he founded his first company in 2011. And then he worked on it for three years until he decided to stop. And that's also his biggest failure. So let's hear what happened over there. Yeah. So at the time it was like a, it was like a social network for like sales people. So it was like a, uh, the idea is that you had your LinkedIn for your work contacts. You had Instagram. Um, actually, Instagram was quite young at the time, but more for like uh, friends and interests and Twitter for interests. Facebook was more for friends and family. But then there was no like thing covering the space of like these contacts that weren't really work related but more like sales uh, or interaction related so for example some more leads yeah or like if you're a vip shopper or somewhere you get this like personal uh personal assistant kind of thing to help you who remembers you like this like red dress or red you know coat so a new item that comes in is that uh or it's like if you have service providers right that like they're not really a linkedin connection but they are people that you interact with from time to time um like let's say that's a plumber or um anything like that cleaner different things uh so there's just like this this interesting piece of the network that isn't really covered by the social networks and i still think it it's is interesting but um yeah at that, at that time yeah i just didn't know much about anything and was just trying to try to make this thing happen and um i remember yeah, how do I think is like a big failure? I think like one at the time, I think I was making like maybe it was two thousand a month after like a year, and that was living in San Francisco. Um, so I remember it being quite bare bones, uh, living in a sense there. Uh, yeah. But, um, but it didn't matter, right? Like my my room was quite empty and i remember one of the places i lived at is literally just the bed that was it and like it came with a closet so you would use that but i remember just like i only used it to sleep um and then outside i had this little desk where i had my like workstation and stuff um and like it was, i think we worked on it for like three years and it changed so much in terms of the idea because it just it wasn't working like people we one we weren't like selling it in a sense so i had no feedback in terms of like if people were willing to buy it was i solving a you know big enough problem in that sense um so you were just working on the product all the time and not talking to customers or what happened uh it was a lot more working on product than talking to customers but we still talked to customers like we had different little shop owners on like we tried onboarding a little part of uh san francisco it's this place called sausalito which is north of san francisco try to get like this whole network of them on first to see if like that would help because they're all close to each other but of course a lot of people didn't want to join as well and we'd set up their shop take all the photos we'd do everything we could to just do it for them and these are the things you like you read about right in terms of like the airbnb founders going to the apartment owner's house and like taking photos and like um doing all that so you we were just like trying to do a lot of these things to just where they don't have to um too much but i think there's just so many fundamental flaws in like the thinking and how it's executed because you're just i i was just not as aware of like how this all kind of works and goes together um even even if i did or whatever but you it's hard to know while you're you're in it um and you learn as you go right as you iterate you learn there's no way you can just know how it all works so just going through all of that and um how the product transformed 
like at the end it became it's crazy it just became like this like text over image tool where you would like can create like quotes and stuff which is like really random and they talk about yeah they talk about these things called pivots uh yeah that's just and i learned like that's not really a pivot that's like a whole different direction but that, turn, yeah <laughs> but that started actually getting like usage like we got that up to a point of like it was hundreds of photos per week and then it was going into a thousand per week so like people were using it so that was the first time i felt that something was happening but that was like three years in so at that time the money is gone and like the belief in the company like um was was gone and um yeah so that was i would say the biggest failure because of maybe all the time kind of spent trying to make that work and like you i mean you can we're trying all sorts of different things even different ideas and um my co-founder left uh i want to say like maybe year two in so then i was still trying to like make something happen um yeah so if you could go back now with the knowledge you have currently, what would, what would you change? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I think like starting with the idea. Uh, and it's, it's hard because, yeah, you don't, don't know as much then. And just really trying to um, break it down and say, okay, who is this really for and what problem are we solving? Um, and really try to answer that question. And if you can't answer that question, you know, talk to those people, which is kind of how we did with this company. We said, okay, who's 300 people we can talk to or not even talk to. This is 300 people. We hope a few of them will talk to us. And a few of them did, I think it's like a 2% or 3%. I forget what I, what I saw basically. Um, yeah, not many people talk to you. Uh, so that was a big one. So like, if I look back, I'd be like, okay, how can we just like talk to these actual, you know, salespeople or whatever. And it's it's weird because I mean we did like I remember like trying to bring donuts to like a Porsche and like Ferrari shop just to get them to talk to me. The Ferrari guy like saw through it. He almost got he almost got caught. You know he almost uh, he almost fell for it. Uh, and he was like, no, no, we can't do that here. But then the uh, Maserati guys were like all about you know they're like donut time. So I got to talk to them about it. I was trying to get them on board, but. Um, yeah, it, it, you just have to navigate, like, do they even have the power to make these decisions of, like, using some random app to connect with their customers? Is that company protocol? Is that really the same as email? Um, so there's all those kinds of things. Uh, but I think that would be number one is, like, really spend a lot of time, even before building anything, just, like, trying to talk to those people and, like, yeah, just constantly, like, every month every week how can you keep talking to those particular people as to where the idea kind of um is connected to after the company failed joe started working on a new company in 2017 called mighty scout mighty scout helps brands and agencies track instagram influencer campaigns so um we also help these companies find influencers uh rather than them doing it themselves manually uh, and they come to us to pretty much uh, make that whole process easier uh, and to save their team a lot of time. Joe was working on this project with his co-founder, Kevin, and in the beginning, they didn't know what they wanted to make until... One day, like while I was talking to a coworker, um, she started telling me a bit about how she has this uh, Instagram account that promotes or takes pictures of mac and cheese. Mm -hmm. And she one day got contacted by like a tabasco company or something and she showed me the message of like uh how they were asking her to take photos of the mac and cheese with the tabasco that they would send like they would send her a case of it and i was like oh that's interesting like that's kind of i guess weird because i like first got um exposed to this um and i was used to just taking pictures of my own food on instagram so it's just like it was interesting and then um, we had some friends who were also talking a bit about it and how uh, they were hearing about these things called influencers and how um, they could take photos uh, in exchange for either products or like money and uh, things like that. So that's when um, when I was talking to Kevin, we started looking more into 
what what could be here and what kind of uh is going on and really just like we didn't know too much about the space i would say at all um just that this kind of stuff was happening uh i think kevin knew a bit more about the space so about instagram in general or uh, where were you like yeah more like yeah the mostly the influencer space but then of course um that still goes back to instagram itself right because uh, influence marketing exists on multiple platforms, YouTube, uh, Twitch, all sorts of different things. But Instagram was the specific one. Um, so we we didn't know too much um, there. But Kevin also was mentioning that like he saw that there are some people he would follow and they would promote products as well. Uh, so he's like he was used to you know following different people and seeing this. When they started, they were trying to understand Instagram influencer marketing better, and they asked themselves the following questions. What do they even do on Instagram? What are they trying to do? What's hard for them? Um, what do they wish could be easier? What do they currently pay for in terms of tools? Um, what are the key problems that they feel they have? So then the hope was that as we talk to more and more people, there will be some overlap, right? And we start to develop like a uh, hypothesis for what types of problems exist in this space. Makes sense. Yeah. So like one really big one that came up and I mean, continues to be talked about today is just like, how do you grow your Instagram following, right? Because a brand wants to go from 1,000 to 10,000 to 50,000 uh, because they, of course, believe that that like, translates to uh, views and reach, uh, which yeah. leads to sales. So uh, that was probably a really, really big one that we kept hearing about. And then, um, we, of course, we knew about influencers. So then we would also ask some questions related to that or as they they spoke about it we would, or we would ask them um how they go about it currently and um slowly learn about the different pieces that were difficult for them but man uh, that's still like three years ago and even then like the amount that um we didn't know and what they were saying we still like even with all that information still didn't know much about i would say how it the overall space like looks and like feels and works one of joe's first challenges was generating demand and getting customers to pay for the product i think that uh i want to say the first time that we really felt like someone i guess wanted the product was just when people like started paying for it and that came from a mix of like running like google ads and then of course people were like cold emailing and saying hey would you be interested in this kind of service? And I still remember like the, f like the first one we almost sold to, um, man, it, but I feel like I learned a lot thinking now how we kind of sell it. Uh, the first one, like we were offering the product for like, I think $79 or something. Um, and was it just a random number you came up with? Or? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You always have like our lowest one was like 29 or something. And then 79 was like the bigger package to give them options. Um, and yeah, we, we definitely didn't have so much bearing on like what that would be. I mean, our lowest package for that product now is like $500. So it's like a huge difference. But even then, um, we were talking to this person, I think, for like a month month and a half um like gave her a sample she's like this is all good we you found people that like i don't think i would have been able to find or it would have just took me a lot of time to find so we're like okay this is great we're hearing good things good things and then when it comes time to pay of course um <clears throat> we presented them you know with the 79 uh package and then they were like oh well can we still try it you know for free or something like that and then after a whole month or something then maybe we'll pay for it and we you know took that gamble of saying of course like no like i don't even know if you'd call it a gamble but like uh this this is you know just what it is and we feel like this is this is fair um so you then, really said no to that customer and you have to pay for it and yeah like it wouldn't be fair to others for them to get it for free for a month and it takes it takes work to do because we we're still i think doing this all manually at the time and but the main thing is we're still just testing would people even pay for this and then it turns out that they didn't uh pay for it but like now when i look back and i wish i knew this you know then um the way i would approach it then is um instead of 
you know, saying no or whatever, I would say, hey, look, uh, what we can do, because they, they have like, it's just an objection, right? They have like a fear of like, they want to make sure that their money is well spent and like they're not wasting money and all these different things. And I think the best, one of the best ways to do that, at least I feel right now, is um, just doing a money back guarantee. So say, hey, you can get it for that month, $79, just, you know, pay us the 79 And if you aren't satisfied at the end of that month, we just refund you the 79 So it doesn't cost you anything. But if you are, then of course, you're just a customer and continue. So then I think that like that helps both sides because now they feel way less um, fear because there is, there's no negative impact to yeah. it. And then uh, we also get the benefit of like, is someone willing to pay? Because even if you have that, people still make a conscious, conscious decision of like, this is real money that I'm about to spend. Um, not many people will just say like, okay, this is just going to be free. And like, I'm 100% going to cancel right when they, uh, right when the month is up, no matter what. Like, that's not how I think some, uh, most people operate. Is this something <laughs> you implemented now in your business? How oh, you yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's a big part of uh, what we do now. Um, we, we don't do any more free trials. <clears throat> so we went through a phase of not really doing a free trial. We did like a sample. So we called that like, here's like five people. You can see what we can kind of find. And then um, now we just do, and then we did free trials. So we did like a two-week free trial or something. I think it started actually with a month, but then the month is like way too long. It's like the sales cycle is like way, way too long. And then it was two weeks. And then with two weeks, you're still finding like, if we're doing a lot of stuff manually, um, it's a lot of work. And like, there's, you get a lot of people um, that maybe aren't as serious. And then uh, with money back guarantee, um, it just it has them put a little skin in the game. So then it's uh, a little bit more balanced. And then um, it also, it also makes it easier to do the transition of um, them becoming like an ongoing customer because they don't need to like, you know, bring out the credit card and like do all this different types of stuff because they've already crossed that hurdle with the initial payment. Like they already will talk to the accounting team. So the accounting team is aware that they're paying for something or something like that. So the next step is just like, hey, approval or not. And then, um, yeah. And then if they're not satisfied, then it's just like a full refund for the, just that trial period, which is a smaller amount um, than this like, you know, whole uh, paying for this whole big, big product. And what was the most important thing that you learned throughout your years as a founder that you could tell someone who would like to do what you're doing? One of the big ones, of course, is like just doing something uh, because you're going to learn through, through doing. Uh, and the first thing is always going to be terrible and like horrible, but like that starts like think stops all the imaginary thoughts and like makes it more concrete. So then you can see the parts that are kind of missing. Um, so I think that that's a, that's a big one. And then I think um, like being quite frugal is important. So I remember my friend, when he visited my place in San Francisco, it's my friend from college, and he was like, oh, still living like a college days, I see, <laughs> right? With my, like, single futon bed that, like, wasn't even mine. It was, like, from a friend. Uh, like, all those kinds of things. And um, I think that's really important because um, you're going to, like, learn through doing things, but, like, you need enough time to, like, learn and explore this idea. Uh, like, I think that a lot of people, um, like choose like, Hey, let's try to figure this out in one year or something. If it doesn't work in a year and then it's done. And I think that that's like a bit of a mistake because these things do take some time. Uh, and I think there's like one of these, uh, investors and founders, he says like two years is kind of like the, uh, amount that someone needs to be willing to like give to something because then around year two is when it could still be quite hard, but at least you're like seeing something potentially happen. Um, and I think the nature of being like uh, frugal helps you get there because um, I feel if you are, and this is coming from a perspective of like non VC backed uh, company, uh, because if you're VC backed, you don't have to worry about 
uh, running out of money and all those types of things. Well, you do, but like not in the sense of like eating some food or, you know, a place to, to stay and things like that, because um, you just have money uh, from the VC in terms of like a salary. Um, and what would be your personal metric when someone should stop or like what are the metrics and time frames that you would recommend that's always like a super hard call and i think um that's why like mission driven companies can be uh quite quite big because that gives you that extra push uh i think also like starting something on the side and maybe it's just like a project thinking like a project or side project uh it could be while you're you know you're working or freelancing doing things like that then it technically doesn't need to like uh stop in a sense because it's just like on and off based off of your what you're working on but um i think it's hard it's just the longer that something goes and nothing is changing um I kind of feel like if you've tried everything you feel like you could you could try, um, then maybe that's a time to stop. And then uh, you can always make something else another time or come back to it in the future. But don't you feel like sometimes there can be a really bad month where you have that feeling every day? Oh, I tried everything and I'm kind <laughs> of done with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> I tried everything yesterday. <laughs> um yeah that's man it's yeah it's it's tough i think uh reaching out to others who like um have advice um like literally you could cold email a lot of people like for example there's this accelerator called y combinator and all of those people you they have their emails listed and you could literally just say hey i'm building this this like i'm struggling with this could, like what would you recommend which is a question and like it's weird but a lot of people will just respond and help you and they've done it in the past um and i think that so that's important is to have the advice of like knowing you know knowing things you can do because even though it feels like you might have tried everything i think it's important to objectively see like hey have we truly tried all the things we feel we can reasonably do right like um by getting a second opinion Yeah, second opinion or objectively like looking at like, hey, here's a list of all the potential things we can do. Is it true that like we uh, tried all these different things? And then also looking at like, again, it's always talking to the customers and users. I think that's another big, big learning is like, what do they feel is not working? And um, like, why aren't they willing to buy or why did they leave, right? And it sucks because people will leave or people won't buy and you will ask them a question and they won't even answer it. Yeah. And you're just like, you follow up and there's no answer because they're like, whatever, I'm done. Um, yeah, I don't care about this yeah, anymore. Yeah, <laughs> like, this is not my problem. And it sucks because you're like putting in all this time and like years, but in their mind, it doesn't matter. Like what matters to them is they have a bunch of other things to do. Um, but hopefully if you do it enough time, someone will give you an inkling of like what was missing or like what needs to be there. And then trying to like, solve that maybe helps get to the next step so always be kind to people and give feedback <laughs> <laughs> yeah some people <laughs> definitely and in general i'm curious because you're working together with a lot of influencer marketing campaigns so how do you think that the landscape will change in the next five years when it comes to influencer marketing uh i mean maybe i'm biased but like the i mean all i do is think about and like see it and then i also evaluate it against like what we can do marketing wise um i truly think it's going to be a standard like just like seo is just like paid advertising is and it, it has been in the past like influence marketing it's it's tricky it has like a really um buzzwordy name that has worked out well for it to grow uh but it's been around for a while like for example if you look at red bull um or look at any of these big brands like they're they call them celebrity endorsements so it's like the yeah. high level uh so if you think before the internet that's always existed um and if you think of like these things called tastemakers it's always existed because there's just some people who are really into something and they know much more about it than others um so that's why we go to them that happens when you google anything you find a blog when you look up anything on youtube you find it's just a natural part of like how i think things things work so 
I feel like uh, it's still really early. Like the level at which you can leverage influence marketing, I think it, with these new internet, you know, pipes that are kind of built and these new networks um, is insane because it really requires a different type of thinking of like, we don't have to make everything now as a company. Uh, we have a lot of fans and like people are really into this stuff, like more than like you would think anyone could be that um, are so into it that they are willing to, uh, if they believe in the mission or, you know, is a paid, it's paid advertisement are willing to make this. And there's so much you can do. So in terms of uh, as a more concrete example, uh, I love the example of if you're promoting a product in a variety of different regions. So let's say Africa, uh, Asia, and, and Asia has, you know, in all these, there's multiple countries within these continents, like Japan, Korea, uh, Thailand, they all uh, receive messages in different ways. So the more native you can make them, like from people from that country or that are already plugged in, which are influencers, right? But at a smaller uh, scale like they have thousands of followers you know uh, tens of thousands then as you work with these different people with your brand to promote a certain like product or message it's just going to resonate more because the person in korea is going to be speaking korean and they're going to show it in a maybe korean landscape right so then now all of that is very very focused uh to it's they call like marketing at scale right to where it's like so specific to each region and each uh culture and then the another layer on top is you can now work with that content. So let's say influencers create that content and you want to run a paid advertising campaign in Korea, right? Using and leveraging this Korean influencer, um, you can now do that using that content. So imagine being able to do that by that's country, but what if you could do that by city, right? So New York City versus Los Angeles versus San Francisco, those are all very different things. So when someone from San Francisco sees this creative, they see things they are familiar with um, mm-hmm. and that resonate with them. So you just it's, if you think of that and you compare that against a world where you have to have your own team, you have to fly out these different people to these different locations to shoot this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's insane. <clears throat> yeah, that's a very interesting perspective. And do you have like a last key takeaway that you want our listeners to take away from this that somehow helped you grow personally? I think, well, for me, I think like right now I'm trying to like, I don't know if you say conquer or like figure out um, this idea of like, or feeling of always being able to do more or more must be done and that kind of thing. Uh, It's like this beast that just like always exists uh, for pretty much everyone. And like, we're aware of it, but how do you kind of manage and like deal with that, Uh, especially as in a startup and especially when things aren't going well it's like it can be good because it like drives you uh but then it can be uh can lead to burnout right like if you push way too much it could really destroy someone um so i'm trying to like that's just something that i'm trying to be more mindful of and um and i think maybe as we're getting to a point where we can find ways to like delegate things uh, or if you like find ways to put things into more of a process and get, try to get beyond that point of like the Superman have to do everything. Like it's just, that's not sustainable, especially with building a company, right? Like there's a reason companies require so many people to like do stuff. Um, I would say like, that's, that's a really big one um, to kind of be, mindful of and aware of and just remember that like you can try to trying to be in the present of like what you can do today and then there's always you know tomorrow to do this because as i say it's a cliche of like it's a marathon not a sprint it's like it truly truly that type of thinking i think helps conquer this idea because it's it's endless um and as a product grows customers want more and more things because you can make their lives better which is really nice but um that has to be managed somehow so i'm still still trying to figure that out and i think it's one of the biggest things i'm still trying to figure out um but i would say yeah like pace pace yourself like i said that one year could be 
quite underestimating two years that takes takes time and like i think a lot of the news and the media covers um these overnight successes and everyone knows or not everyone but like they take multiple years to like get somewhere and um yeah a lot of your peers might appear to be growing like super super quickly or there's a success but this could be you know many companies for them it's not their first time right yeah um or if it was their first time maybe something there is some sort of luck involved um but yeah like there's a lot of people it just it takes time and that's just how it goes and and also sometimes you might not make it like that's another thing to <laughs> yeah to think of but <laughs> that that just means maybe um you can try the next thing or maybe there's something else that is more fitting for you maybe just finding what you like to do um it it can be connected to that so yeah time is luckily on your side but you just gotta i think mindset wise adjust that because it'll it'll destroy you if you think this can all just be done very quickly and if people want to find out more about you where can they find you online or how can they get in touch with you yes so the best way is probably on twitter um it's just at anderson 760 and then um i do have a blog at yoshosh.com it's y-o-s-h y-o-s-h.com um but yeah feel free to just send me a message on twitter you want to talk about any of those things or if there's any way i can i can help because i do know like um starting you know your company for the first time or just like working in this space uh there's a lot of little little tricks that can help and um being helpful is definitely one of them that like can get you quite far if you truly like try to help someone so for example like i've done literally a whole product design screen for somebody um and it shortcuts the um relationship in terms of like how much you're willing to put in to help someone um versus just saying how can i be helpful which this appears to have become a meme these days (laughs) (laughs) to sum up if you have an idea it's essential to start doing something related to it Don't be discouraged if things take longer than you initially planned. And if you're struggling with something, ask someone for help. Thank you so much for watching or listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on YouTube or your preferred podcast platform. And let me know what you enjoyed and what I can improve on.